Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Very glad to have you with us for the Monday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Uh, Jim Garrity is traveling for work for the first few days of uh, this week. And today we've got Rob Long, uh, co-founder of Ricochet, contributing editor at National Review Online, host of the Martini Shot podcast, co-host of the Glop podcast. I hear he's doing like a New York City bar crawl that he's somehow yes. getting paid for. <laughs> well, I, I don't know about getting paid for. I mean, that, that's a rare event that I get paid for. But yes, uh, May 14, join Ricochet and you get to come to a bar crawl. That's the fun. That's and we'll have some special sweet. guests here. And because uh, look, you know what? We're, we're planting a flag. COVID's over. Well, the White House Correspondents Dinner can gather at some twee little event and have their stupid prom. We can get together at a bar in New York and um, cause some trouble. No mask. If you wear a mask, you can get a swirly. Put it that way. Wow. So it's just like prom. You know, somebody, you, <laughs> yeah, right. you guys still got your bullies. You people get yeah. swirlies and stuff. So well, I went to a fancy school, so we wouldn't do that. We would just, you know, withering witticisms about you in the corner. <laughs> That's right. There's never bullying at fancy schools. Uh, so <laughs> let's go on to our good martini. Uh, and uh, uh, Rob, uh, this is not necessarily good news on the top, although some people might uh, disagree with that. But I think overall, long term, this is a good thing. Uh, public schools in many different parts of the country are having to close buildings, uh, not hire people. In some cases, unfortunately, uh, reduce staff because they don't have as many students anymore. Uh, so we can debate whether that's good, but uh, I think long-term that's going to be good. Here's what the Associated Press writes. A school system in suburban Kansas City is eliminating more than 100 jobs, including kindergarten aides and library clerks. Oakland, California is closing seven schools. Other districts around the country are merging classrooms, selling buildings, and leaving teaching positions unfilled in order to close budget gaps. Public school systems are beginning to feel the pinch from enrollment losses tied to the coronavirus pandemic. Money for schools is driven partly by student headcounts and emergency provisions in many states allowed schools to maintain funding at pre-pandemic levels. But like the billions of dollars of federal relief money that have helped schools weather the crisis, those measures were not meant to last forever. So where do the kids go? Well, they've gone to private schooling. They've gone to homeschooling. And so, uh, Rob, the reason I think this is good, we're not happy that necessarily good, you know, that good teachers and, and so forth have lost their jobs, at least temporarily in some of these places. But one of the big problems with the public schools and one of the reasons they keep failing, especially in our urban centers, is that they don't have any competition. And now that parents have seen more clearly what's happening in these schools, they've explored and they're pursuing other options, whether it's in their own home or these private schools, it creates competition. And for the public schools, more competition, I think, can only be good. Yeah, what, it's like, what is this, a Sherlock Holmes mystery? People wondering, well, I wonder what happened. What seems to have gone on? This is a mystery. We have to call in the Hardy Boys or you know, Encyclopedia Brown to figure out why it is that people, that American parents across the country have decided that they don't want to send their kids to school, the public schools anymore. This was inevitable, and it, it, it could only end this way. And it is, I think it is actually unreservedly good news. Because it means for the first time that they, the public schools are being responsive to the customers, which are the parents, only the parents. That those are the only customers they really have. Parents were home and they were walking by the Zoom and they heard what the students, their, their, their kids were learning and they were starting to pay attention. And they were paying attention in places like Florida. They were paying attention all over the country and they just were not happy with the with the subject matters they were not happy with the level of mastery that their children were displaying in the things that they felt that they needed you know we had this entire science lesson national science lesson for two years where everybody kind of looked at everybody else said wait what what's a epi what's a virus like, nobody knew and your kid who's supposed to know this stuff didn't but knew that there are 27 genders but didn't could not tell you mrna it was now, that is not how it's supposed to go. Your kid's supposed to know this stuff because your kid's supposed to be learning it. And, you know, you're supposed to be dumb and your kid's supposed to be smart. You, it's not supposed to be the other way around. And so I think parents thought to themselves, all right, well, we, we just did an experiment in homeschooling and it wasn't that bad. So why not keep going? And that was a disaster for the school systems and for the school bureaucracy who did, who did the thing that bureaucrats always do when they're failing. They doubled down on failure. And so the last year or so, we haven't heard them say, 
okay, we're going to stick to our knitting. We're going to get back and roaring. It's going to be three R's. We're going to no. Instead, they've done the opposite, uh, which is what people do when they're in a death spiral. They just they double down. Um, this is unbelievably good news for people who care about education, education reform. The thing to do now is to press hard on the throat of the education blob. No mercy. Push hard. Break it in half. And maybe in the next two, three, four, five, six, ten years, we'll see an actual flourishing of real reform, real choice, and some real rigor where, <laughs> where we desperately need it in secondary education, primary secondary education, um, which will be benefit everybody. I mean, the, the irony is this will benefit everybody, not just the smart kids, not just the at risk kids, but I mean, all, the trans kids. Like, I don't know why all of a sudden the trans kids don't have to know this hard stuff either. Everybody's got to learn that the future is going to be more complicated, more technological than the past. And if you are not prepared, it does not matter what you want your gender to be. If you're running the drive through line for a fast food company that is owned by the Chinese. <laughs> a couple of thoughts uh, in follow up here, Rob. A few days ago, I was watching uh, an old Western, uh, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. I'm sure you've seen it, uh, John Wayne and, and Jimmy Stewart. I mean, with that, that cast, you can't go wrong. They literally devote, I, I think, like three, four, five minutes to Jimmy Stewart teaching the town a civics lesson. He's you know, the lawyer that comes to town. And it's this, uh, you know, honest, straightforward, accurate uh, uh, explanation of how our government works. There's not a, a cynical approach to it. And I'm like, where is anybody like this, not only in Hollywood, but in uh, establishing you know, public school curriculums? I'm sure there are, are good civics teachers and good civics programs in certain schools around the country, but it's not like it was uh, from what I understand. You look at these surveys of whether people can name the three branches of government and you know, they can pass you know, some of the questions that uh, incoming citizens um, have, to, have to answer. Uh, it's, it's pretty pathetic. So a uh, little more of that, a little less of the uh, cultural uh, propaganda sure would, i mean the cultural get... propaganda i always thought to which should be the the big offer to the progressive teachers union should be like okay look you could that's your that's the sun that's the ice cream sundae the dessert at the end of the meal if you can show proficiency if your students can you know, arrange great big american historical events on a timeline in the right order and uh you know uh, do some quadratic equation stuff and you know i don't know like code in a certain you know advanced computer language then you could teach them all the nonsense you want but you first they have first have to be able to write an english paragraph that makes sense and do all those other things do that first and then you know if then if you finish early right you you accomplish that by 10th or 11th grade you know 12th grade can be just this you know, circus of trans sex, whatever you want, man. Yeah, you can go to town to. on that. As long as they, as long as they could do all the stuff we want them to do, they're yours. They could, you know, the boys can have to wear makeup and dresses. I don't care what you want to do for the senior year, as long as they could do the hard stuff. But they don't want to do that. They want to do the easy, fun stuff first. They want to, you know, creep them out with all the sex stuff first. It's like, uh -uh, do the hard stuff first. Um, and the parents, of course, aren't putting up with it. This is unreservedly good. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be hard. We don't have the stomach for it as a culture because we're going to start seeing teachers really unhappy. We're going to start to see schools being closed. And Americans like teachers. They like schools. They like education. But it's the, this is the only way. It's gone too far for too long. Um, things need to be turned over. Yeah, I'm going to have to disagree with you on that. I think if you master the basics, you should just go harder to harder subjects in those categories <laughs> okay, than, all right, all than, right. than the nonsense. But, you know. All right. Well, you uh, know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a squish. I'm a rhino. That's, the, you know, what we rhinos do. <laughs> well, they learn their lesson, though. That's the question. Or they just keep doubling and tripling down. That's 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 what I suspect will happen, at least initially, as long as you got people like Randy Weingarten calling the shots. Uh, but you, you can only call the learn. shots if there are kids in the classroom. If there are no kids in the classroom, you can have a lot of teachers having, you know, rainbow uh rainbow parade trans day and no kids to march you know what 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 if you threw an indoctrination and there were no <laughs> students to indoctrinate well that would be one upside of this but uh wow yeah crazy but uh hopefully encouraging and uh republicans and whoever school choice uh keep pushing school choice give parents more options at, at the state level and uh you will do very well electorally, especially right now. Make that a primary issue this year, uh, and uh, the outlook will be even better. All right, uh, Rob, let's take a, a quick look at our first great sponsor of the day. And, uh, you know, Mondays are hard, but what if you knew you had free filet mignon coming to your house every month? I think that would uh, encourage me uh, to get a good start to, to, to Monday and, and just, just in general. But, uh, you know, uh, the meat situation in this country 
It's a little complex. 60% of U.S. pork production comes from one company. It's owned by the Chinese. And their hogs are given something called ractopamine, which is banned in 160 countries, including China. Yep, for some reason we can still find it in our grocery aisle every day. But there is a better way, and I'd like to tell you about Moink. And Moink, as we'll explain here in just a moment, and I've mentioned many times, a fantastic service to get the best quality meat delivered straight to your doorstep. Yeah, Moink is moo plus oink. Delivers grass-fed and grass-finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, and sustainable wild-caught Alaskan salmon. It is straight to your door. Moink farmers farm like our grandparents did, and as a result, Moink meat tastes like it should because the family farm, of course, does it better. The Moink difference is a difference you can taste and you can feel good knowing you're helping family farms stay financially independent too. You choose the meat delivered in every box, like ribeyes to chicken breast to pork chops to salmon fillets and much more. Plus, you can cancel any time. I have been blessed to have a number of Moink boxes delivered to my front door. Let me tell you, this meat is phenomenal. I've told you before, I think it's the best bacon I've ever had. The steaks are fantastic. The chicken, I mean, Rob read off the whole list there. Ribeyes, chicken breast, pork chops, salmon, that's all fantastic. I love the Moink box, and I know you will too. So keep American farming going by signing up at moinkbox.com slash martini right now. And listeners to the Three Martini Lunch will get free filet mignon in every order for a year. That's one year of the best filet mignon you'll ever taste, but for a limited time. That's spelled M-O-I-N-K box.com slash martini moinkbox.com slash martini let's uh, go to our bad martini now and one of the things we learned early on in the obama years rob was that they're not shy about uh being happy when a crisis comes because it gives them a better opportunity in their eyes to shove a progressive agenda down our throat we literally just talked about family farmers with our spot with with Moink and how we love them and we want to make their life uh, better and by supporting them and so forth. But right now, uh, costs are high for them, just as they are for everybody due to inflation. One of the biggest problems is fertilizer. Not only is the price going up, uh, there's less of it due to the fact that a lot of it comes from Russia. And so uh, Biden administration official Samantha Power, for Obama, she was at the UN. Uh, she goes on this week, the ABC program, And basically celebrates this problem, literally saying never let a crisis go to waste because this is the transition opportunity uh, to more natural things. Fertilizer shortages are real now because Russia is a big exporter of fertilizer. And even though fertilizer is not sanctioned, uh, less fertilizer is coming out of Russia. As a result, we're working with countries to think about natural solutions like manure and compost. And this may hasten transitions that would have been in the interest of farmers to make eventually anyway. So never let a crisis go to waste, but we really do need this financial support uh, from the Congress to be able to meet emergency food needs so we don't see the cascading uh, deadly effects of Russia's war extend into Africa and beyond. Uh, so there you hear it, Rob. Uh, not a ton of compassion there, just Ooh, sweet. Now we can move even further down the road to our green agenda. Uh, These people are not subtle, and we should probably pay attention when they talk like this. Yeah, all I thought was like, wait, Samantha Power, that name rings a bell. Like, so now she's an expert in agriculture, like she was an expert in Syria, like she was an expert in in who unmasked um, Michael Flynn. These people keep popping up like bad pennies. They don't seem to have any you know, a comet trail of bad decisions and uh, meretricious statements and sort of amazing, you know, sometimes when you appear on, 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 on these news, news uh, channels, they'll have, or, or, or or, uh, on sports, you know, uh, an athlete will appear and they'll um, on on their right or the left of the screen, they'll have kind of like their stats, you know, like what they did last season or previous seasons. I kind of feel like they should have that for certain um, political figures, just their stats lied about uh, unmasking, lied about syria lie, you know, just just to, just so we know when they're talking about how great it is that we're now going to be using comp we should now be composting just where they've come from and what level of expertise they now have are displaying about what we should be doing with our um home garbage it but but it never ceases to be ma- to amaze me just how brazen it all is just like well no that was then this is now then back then I was doing these these things in the service of a sort of another political agenda. And now I'm doing it in service of this other political agenda. I mean, now she's the USA director. So, of course, she's got some other acts to grind. It all kind of like it all, as you say, it all kind of argues to some some very finite set of points that are 
can all be put in certain buckets. Usually, um, you know, climate change is one, one big one. Uh, diversity, equity, inclusion is another, and there's probably a third one coming along the way. But those are the two big ones. And almost every decision and every argument and every issue will be under those two buckets. And this one is uh, obviously climate. And it just, it just, I just find it astonishing that it really doesn't matter where she comes from. It doesn't matter whether she's been sort of discredited or not. It, what matters is that she can spin anything, the war in Ukraine, um, uh, an agricultural crisis into an area of her own personal expertise and her own axe to grind. And we just, and it just sort of happens. And it just, we just sort of let it go. Like, oh, okay, well, she's a celebrity, right? She must know what she's talking about. Uh, and I, I kind of want the score. I want the score box on the left. I want the stats, you know, and I'm, I'm somebody's got to be, be able to give me the stats on the screen. The thing that always amazes me about the left is not only are they happy we're suffering in the moment, their solutions almost always mean more suffering. Yet they're happy about that, too. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious about well, that. Well, look, they want us to eat our vegetables. So anything that can force us to eat our vegetables that are good for us because we're bad, you know, you and I especially. Look, you just did an ad for something that she a company that she probably want to go out of business. She doesn't want them to like, she doesn't want us to eat meat. Like it's, it's not efficient. Um, family farms aren't efficient really. That's pleasure too. It's delicious. So that delicious might, you might be happy. We don't want you happy, Greg, because if you're happy, you might feel entitled to happiness and coming down the line, we got a lot of plans for you and your family and your whole life. And they may not be happy. <laughs> so that's kind of like the whole attitude. The whole attitude to the left is we got other plans for you. So we're going to slowly get you used to being mildly dissatisfied with your lot in life. So you don't notice it when we start making real decisions for you. I mean, I know this is kind of creepy and weird and I'm probably going too far, but you, that, that's the basic gist of it. It's like we're, we, we can't let you make these decisions for yourself because if we did, the decisions you'd make would be ones that would, would we would not approve of. Um, and so we're going to use whatever crisis we have to hand to kind of shoehorn in these behavioral changes that we like. Um, and they, they seem to have lost it on the masking. Um, and so now they're sort of trying other things, right? You know, when everybody erupted in applause when they you know, on the airplanes, when it was announced, you could take the masks off. A lot of people on the left were really surprised. They thought we liked it. And you didn't like it. It's fun. And they, they remember there's like the day and a half where people trying to like, oh, come on, we're going to put the mask back. Come on. And that's kind of what this is. No, come on. We're going to all going to put the composting now. Like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to throw the garbage out like a human being. And that, that they just don't, it just doesn't compute. They can't believe that we don't all want to live that way. Um, the only way to make us live that way is to literally make us live that way. Um, and that's always the subtext of all these things. Of all yeah. these appearances. Their basic approach is we need to convince you that you're miserable, even though you're not, and therefore you'll be more receptive to what we want to do. So then when you actually are miserable, uh, you'll be somehow more accepting of and it. And grateful. And grateful. <laughs> Well, if our cynicism about progressivism, not inaccurate, but if it's worn you out a little bit, uh, we can understand. And for that, uh, you might want to rest up on some quality products from My Pillow. And right now, they've got a fun deal going. It's a BOGO, buy one, get one extravaganza on a lot of their different products. Uh, there is the My Pillow bed sheets as low as fifty nine ninety eight, dollars uh, the Elegance My Pillows as low as forty nine ninety eight, dollars uh, and the Roll and Go Anywhere My Pillows twenty nine ninety eight, dollars and so much more. We have talked about the six piece towel set a lot here on the three martini lunch especially in the past few weeks but today we're going to focus on the roll and go anywhere my pillow rob what is that all about it's really awesome you could use it on your couch your recliner your car it's versatile enough to take it with you on vacation anywhere you go it's available in multiple colors and patterns it's machine washable of course it's dryable you have a 10 year warranty a 60 day money back guarantee which is crazy for a pillow yeah, that's that's really good. That's one of the very few my pillow products I haven't gotten to try yet, but uh, certainly looking forward to the opportunity. Hint, hint. It's a buy one get one extravaganza at mypillow.com slash martini. Bed sheets and my pillows are just the tip of the iceberg. Find the full list of buy one get one offers by visiting mypillow.com slash martini or call 800 874 0104. Stock up with buy one get one free savings today and get Mike Lindell's free book with any purchase. Mypillow.com slash martini or call 800 874 0104. Mypillow.com slash martini. 
All right, Rob, you've alluded a couple of times now to uh, masking theater. You talked about uh, Nerd Prom, the White House Correspondents' Dinner, uh, and then also uh, the shock of the left when people were actually happy. They didn't have to cover their faces for hours on end on airplanes and so forth. Uh, we'll see how the courts ultimately rule on that. I think I think the lifting is going to stand, but we'll see. Uh, when it comes to the border, though, the government's been very curiously uninterested in whether people have COVID. They weren't testing people as they flooded across the border uh, unless they were obviously symptomatic, but it certainly wasn't uh, the type of scrutiny that you and I had to go through to get into different places there for a couple of years. And now uh, the Biden administration isn't going to worry too much about uh, vaccinations of these migrants either, when, of course, they wanted to make all of us get vaccines or lose our jobs. Remember that? I think they're trying to memory hole that one before November, but uh, yeah, that was going on. Uh, The Free Beacon, the Biden administration appears to have abandoned its effort to ensure all migrants apprehended by immigration authorities are inoculated against COVID-19 just a month after the White House said vaccines would be mandatory. According to several individuals familiar with the matter, some of whom requested anonymity to speak candidly, Border Patrol officials in the Rio Grande Valley are exempting migrants from such countries as Guatemala, Haiti, and Mexico. That's going to be a lot of the people. Uh, And migrants from Nicaragua, uh, Cuba, and Venezuela must only receive one dose of the vaccine before they are released into the U.S. interior. Notice the implication uh, that uh, as long as you get your jab, they're going to let you into the country. There's... (laughs) there's, there's Where's the scrutiny of uh, maybe turning you back around because you didn't do it the right way? Ah, uh, no, this is, the, this is the Biden administration. They don't do that. So, uh, Rob, uh, what do you make of the uh, really quick turnaround here? Well, I have two things. One is, I mean, you know, I think this is great news uh, because obviously the first jab will allow Bill Gates to track them, as you know. <laughs> don't don't deny it. Um, the interesting thing is, of course, to fly in from, you know, if you're an American citizen, you want to come in. Uh, to the United States, return to the United States from Mexico. I think you still have to show a negative COVID test, or you did until very, very recently. Um, <laughs> so like it's it's harder to get back into the United States from Mexico as an American than it is apparently to get into the United States uh, just to run across. Um, the, the, of course, the problem is that you have to if to, to, to get a second jab means you have to wait around somewhere um, to wait for the second jab. Where, where would you wait? Probably in a cage somewhere, which would be another problem. Like the, the, the irony about it is that for every president, including the previous one, this border issue has been trouble because it's never as easy as it seems. It's not as it's hard to build a wall. It's hard to get Mexico to pay, pay for it. It's hard to like figure out what to do with people when they come to the border, where to put them. Eventually, you put them in kind of an open air situation that resembles a cage. Like everybody looks terrible and incompetent when you're faced with a border crisis because there's just, just we have these crisscross regulations and we have layers and layers and layers of stupidity over the past 30, 40 years uh, on our, um, well, actually 50 years, probably since 68 of our border policy uh, for Southern border policy. So anything that adds to the complexity is going to add also to the stupidity. So it's, it, so this was not, this was destined to be stupid, no matter what the Biden administration did. This just highlights that of course, because, because it also reminds you that none of the policies about being vaccinated, being vaccinated, but also about social distancing and masking and our COVID policies made sense anyway, because, of course, these people have been outside. So they're probably, you know, they're safe outside. A lot of them are young, so they're not really at risk. Um, they <laughs> they don't need that. They don't really need to the mask. They are a very low risk population. We shouldn't really be worried about them too much. Uh, but of course, because we've created a COVID theater for the past two years, we kind of have to pretend to be worried about them. Um, and then, of course, the very people who have this policy of sort of incredibly weird uh, illogic with regards to vaccine, vaccinating the illegal immigrants crossing the border are then sitting in the, I guess it was the Capitol Hilton at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, dining on whatever they're dining on, being served by servers who are masked themselves at a time that they don't need to be masked. Um, so the, if you're watching this at home and trying to make sense of it, there is no consistent, logical, rational COVID policy from any part of the federal government at any point in its day, whether it's enjoying a meal out, it's having a ceremonial event, it is uh, making immigration policy, at no point does any of it make sense. Um, 
And if you wonder why Americans don't have faith in institutions or why Biden's popularity, I think, is now so close to seven um, or whatever, <laughs> uh, that that's why it's because none of it, none of it makes any normal sense to any normal American paying a normal amount of attention to this. Just check it in every now and then with the Biden administration and you're just greeted with more weird, irrational, totally illogical uh, kind of bedlam style decision making. Um, and so no wonder they have the contempt of the American people. That's all, all they do every day, every minute is earn it. As a local radio host says here in the D.C. area, if the left didn't have double standards, they'd have no standards at all. So- <laughs> But double, at least double standards, they have quadruples. Like it's double standards, at least you can understand, you can predict. They, these are like b- bananas. They're like they're hard to figure out. Like all you really know about them is that whatever it is, uh, uh, whatever loopholes that they, they have, you don't get them. They're not for you. <laughs> wow. Rob, uh, I think we were appropriately cynical today. Maybe a little more than, maybe <laughs> yeah. a little more than Happy usual. Monday, everyone. <laughs> but hey, reality check, right? Yeah, so. right. Uh, well, Rob, always great to have you with us. I'm sure we'll do it again uh, relatively soon. Have a lot of fun on your anti-masking bar crawl in New yeah. York City. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, if you want to know more about it, go to ricochet.com. Uh, join Ricochet. Come uh, and we'll uh, we'll celebrate the, the 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 we'll have our own White House Correspondents Dinner. Um, uh, maybe maybe uh, definitely more fun <laughs> and funnier. I can guarantee it'll be funnier. For sure. <laughs> Rob Log is a co-founder of Ricochet. He's host of the Martini Shot podcast, co-host of the Glop podcast. Uh, he is uh, also contributing editor at National Review Online. In for Jim Garrity. Today, I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us. Do subscribe to the podcast if you don't already. Uh, thank you so much for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Very much appreciative of those, and they help us out. Uh, find us on your home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch Podcast. And follow us on Twitter. Rob is at RCBL. Jim is at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a great Monday, and please join us again on Tuesday for the next Next, three martini lunch. Arizona Attorney General Mark Brnovich joins me to discuss his winning legal fight against the Biden administration to keep Title 42 in place. I'm Sarah Carter. On the latest Sarah Carter show, Brnovich also makes his case to be the Republican nominee for the U.S. Senate. And I'll take aim at Biden's Orwellian Disinformation Governance Board and what the left's real vision for the future of our country is. Join us. Follow the Sarah Carter show at Apple, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts.